How much do you know about the Indian Act? Whatever your answer, it's important to understand that its main goal was assimilation, an eradication of the Indian way of life. Put into law in 1876, the Act centralized authority over Indigenous peoples with the federal government and gave it the right to determine everything from Indian status to personhood to where Indigenous people could live. It allowed for the forcible removal of Indigenous children from their homes and communities and placed them in residential schools, a process which would later be detailed as cultural genocide by the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Since the publication of the Commission's report, many individuals, governments, and businesses across Canada have been attempting to accelerate their adoption of the 94 Calls to Action, which provide a framework about how every sector of society, from education to law to health to commerce, can improve Indigenous relations. Making those changes requires a clear-eyed view of history and an understanding how Canada's legal framework for Indigenous people became so harmful. The Indian Act, a piece of legislation that is almost 150 years old but still in effect today, is at the root of much of that policy. As society, individuals, and businesses move through journeys of reconciliation, it's time we took a much closer look at the legacy of the Indian Act. Welcome to Visiting Experts, a Rotman School podcast featuring backstage conversations on business and society with the influential scholars, thinkers, and leaders featured in our acclaimed speaker series. I'm your host, Brett Hendry, and I'm joined today by Bob Joseph. Bob is an author, professor, and lecturer, and the founder and president of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc., a consultancy focused on helping people and organizations build Indigenous relations. His clients have included Fortune 500 companies, all levels of government, and community organizations across Canada and also internationally. Bob is a member of the Gwawa Anuk Nation, one of the tribes that make up the Kwa Kwa Kewak, the traditional inhabitants of the coastal areas that we now know as Vancouver Island and mainland British Columbia. He is the author of the best-selling book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act, which is a must-read for leaders looking to better understand the Indian Act and its repercussions on Canada's Indigenous populations. Welcome, Bob, to the Rotman School. Thank you, Brett, and thank you, Rotman. This is awesome. I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you. We're so delighted to have you here and to first talk about your book, which has been incredibly well received. It's been on the bestsellers list. I've had many people recommend it to me, and I really appreciated how it walks us through the Indian Act with excerpts, but also wraps those with context and analysis and quotes from the period. But for folks who are listening now who are starting their journey to learn about what the Indian Act is, how would you synthesize what it is and why it's important that we understand more about it? Ah, great question. Going right back to the source and the beginning. So back when we confederated in 1867, there were a bunch of piecemeal laws governing Indians in what had become Canada. And it was decided that we would consolidate all of those piecemeal laws, come up with some new laws to add to it, and we would create this Indian Act. And the Indian Act would give Canada the coordinated approach to this new Indian policy, which was a policy of assimilation. Mm -hmm. Canada believed that the best thing that could happen to Indians, as they thought, was that they would assimilate and become like everybody else. One of the things that we share with the learners is that the Indian Act gave control over Indians, the lands reserved for Indians, to the federal government. They became a federal responsibility at that time. So we decided that in order to be able to track that, we need to create a system, a KPI system. And what we would do is we would legally, racially define them. An Indian agent would show up at your community one day with a pen and a piece of paper, and they'd say name, and you'd say, Aksamalagalese, and they'd say, okay, Bob, Joseph it is, and mm. they'd put my name down on a list, and I would become a category of Indian, a status Indian. Mm -hmm. And this was an assimilation process, so the goal then becomes, how do I get his name off of that list? And so, with that, we passed residential school compliance and attendance and banning of potlatches and overthrowing of hereditary chiefs. And its effects today are still quite profound. It impacts Indians' ability to define themselves as Indians, to be self-governing. And probably the worst one is self-reliance. They really are reliant on federal programming and funding to run their governments and their communities, where before the Indian Act, they were completely self-reliant. They were hardworking and participating in the political and economic mainstream. And so 
when I talk about it in the book, 21 Things, and some of the other things that I've written, we're looking for three things, self-government, self-determination. Nobody in Ottawa gets to tell us who our people are. And self-reliance will participate in the political and economic mainstream of this country, but in a way that protects our cultures. One of the really fascinating ideas that I took from your book was the notion how misguided the act was because it, it paradoxically, if the goal was assimilation, it really didn't accomplish that because it created all of these economic and social barriers for indigenous populations. Yeah. Can you share some of the examples of how it was counter effective in that way? I can share from my own experience. Mid 1990s, sorry, dating myself a little bit old in terms of business, but I'd finished college, I'd studied business administration, I was married, had a really stable utility job. I studied credit when I was in college, and I knew right. that there were these things called the four C's of credit, and that I'd met all of those. One day I was shopping for a vehicle in a firm in Burnaby in British Columbia and made a deal with the salesperson. They shipped me off to the business services manager. So this business service manager said, what do you do? I said, I'm in communications. And she said, what kind of communications? I said, well, corporate communications. And, and she said, what kind of, you know, and I thought, okay, she's not going to give up here. So I said, if you must know, I'm an Aboriginal awareness cross-cultural trainer. I teach people how to work with Indigenous peoples or Aboriginal peoples would have been the terminology of the time. And she said, oh, are you a uh, status Indian? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, okay, well, we can definitely arrange to have the vehicle delivered to the reserve for you because we won't have to pay the GST. And Section 87 of the Indian Act says they're not subject to seizure under legal process. So she's like, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll deliver it to the reserve. But tell me, do you have somebody who can co-sign for you? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, we're going to need a co-signer. And I said, are you sure? Because BC Hydro, pretty stable utility, right? got a full-time job, I'm married, you know, all of the seas of credit. She said, yeah, the problem is if you drive it to the reserve, reserves aren't subject to seizure under legal process. So if you stop paying for it, we can't come and repossess. And so we're going to need a co-signer. So I had to get my wife, who's non-Indigenous, to co-sign for me. Still recently, not only could I not borrow the money, but I couldn't get insurance on a residence property that I wanted to live in. And so it seems like a really old document going right back to Confederation, but it's still there doing what it was designed to do, even though I think it's fair to say we've largely abandoned forced cultural assimilation. It's like a drift net that's been separated from the ship at sea. Mm -hmm. The ship's not connected to it anymore, but it's still doing what it was designed to do, catch and kill fish. And the Indian Act's still doing that. I think that story is so powerful because for some people, they may think that it's this ancient document from over 100 years ago, but it clearly still has ramifications today and is clearly still creating barriers and burdens to economic engagement. And it certainly does not <laughs> engage in any type of assimilation. Yeah. I want to talk about land. It seems so central to how Indigenous communities and the Canadian government have interacted over the years. And you speak in your book about the creation of reserves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how these have been really a barrier to Indigenous populations engaging in full economic opportunities. Can you share a little bit about the history of reserves mm -hmm. and why we need to understand why they've been so detrimental to Indigenous folks? The idea of a reserve is basically a holding pen. It's a place where we're going to put them until they assimilate. Indians living on reserve, you can ask them, mm -hmm. do you own this, Bob? Oh, yeah, it's fine. My family's been here for 16 generations or 127 generations, whatever they feel their history is. And they don't own the lands that they live on. The title is vested in Her Majesty. So they are parcels of land set aside for the use and benefit of Ben, and you don't own it. So let's say I've got a business that sells to Hydro One. All I need is a little bit of money that I can maybe increase my sales to Hydro One. They're doing their reconciliation and their indigenous relations, and they're reaching out to do procurement on their side. We could come to a pretty good arrangement, but I still might have trouble raising the funds to help provide transistors or whatever widget it is that we need to get to Hydro One. And so that's something that the Indian Act still does. 
we want to do economic reconciliation. We're actively seeking procurement people, but they can't get the banks to lend the money, especially if they're working off the reserve and they don't have collateral because they don't own the house or the land they live in. So a couple of big strikes, it makes it pretty tough. It's so interesting as a legacy of the Indian Act, how not owning the real estate has had this negative consequence, especially in a country like Canada now, where so much wealth is being transferred in between generations through mm -hmm. real estate. Mm -hmm. One of the other legacies of the Indian Act that I wanted to explore with you is its discrimination against women. Yeah. And I was hoping you could share with us a bit of history of how the Act treated women and what some of the repercussions are to this day. So we're trying to assimilate. We need to find ways to make that happen. And intermarriage would become a really key feature of that whole process. And so Indian women, all the way up until 1985, who married non-Indian men, they could be anybody from any culture, would lose their status and so mm -hmm. would their children. And if you lost your status, you had to leave the reserve. That really has hurt women, particularly, that they would lose that status through marriage where the men didn't. And again, what was motivating it was that we we're trying to get their names off the list. One of the other areas that you really speak about quite movingly in your book is education and some of the educational provisions in the Act. Mm -hmm. And you write that residential schools were, quote, the most aggressive and destructive provisions in the Act. And I think for a lot of Canadians who learned about the residential schools in 2021 through Kamloops and the discussion that happened around that, it's been quite shocking. As somebody who has really studied the history, can you share with us what are the most important things that we need to understand about the residential schools? They were, I think, our most aggressive effort. I mean, all of the other effort is not light either, but mm -hmm. the idea that we would forcibly remove the children from their kinship group today is considered genocide. But the ideology was if we could separate the kids from the families and communities, we could go a long way to this assimilation process. And so Indian Act legislation allowed for the forced removal of Indian children from the age of 6 to 16 to go to church-run, government-funded institutions that were geared specifically to the process. And when I first started doing this work in BC Hydro, I was about the fourth workshop in. I can remember this lady coming up to me on a coffee break, and she was crying. She had tears streaming down her face. I don't like to think I'm a meanie, and I try not to make people feel emotional. I try to create a really safe space for learning. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I can't believe you. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I can't believe my church would be involved in what you were just talking about. And then the government, for her, it was just listen to somebody with a conspiracy theory. So I had to explain, look, I work for a crown corporation. I can't just come out here and say anything I want. This is valid and reliable information. It's been researched and you're going to learn a lot more about it over the years. And if you haven't heard, you can go take a look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission traveled across the country for five years, mm -hmm. capturing stories of Canadians and residential school survivors. That's what they call themselves, the people that went to those schools. And you can see how dark a chapter it really was was. For me, Kamloops and the 215 was the mirror for Canadians. We kind of held the mirror up and they had to really look at themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. I think reconciliation is such a positive force that gives us an opportunity to move past all of that. I get asked all the time, what do you think government should do? And I always say, look, I, I hope they do a lot, but I'm not betting on government. I'm really betting on Canadians. I'm betting on them to continue the calls to action, which are learn about the history, the culture, the UN declaration, those kinds of things. And to understand that reconciliation is not a short-term thing, that it took us four generations to get into this mess. I hope it's not going to take us four to get out, but mm -hmm. I also realize it's not going to happen in five years or ten years. Among other calls for action from organizations, the TRC asked businesses to committing meaningful consultation, like building respectful relationships, and obtaining free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding with economic development. So considering the work you've done with organizations, what are the risks to companies that don't take into account this particular request for meaningful consultation? If you're engineering, if you're environmental management, 
you don't get away from Indigenous relations because of reconciliation and some of the commitments that have been made. Everybody gets to do some of this. And that's what I tell my clients. I say, look, you're going to spend $4 billion on this project. Got to make sure that some of it, through your consultative efforts, gets to First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples if they're impacted by your mm -hmm. operations. And you're probably going to tell me, no, we don't do that for anybody. But... Not everybody has Section 35 rights like they do. If we build a pipeline or a road across farmland, we've got to take some of your farmland away. Mm -hmm. We're going to compensate you for that because you have a legal interest in the land. And so I spend a lot of time educating people on this legal interest in land. They have right. a legal interest and it's not been defined and nobody knows what it's worth, but you've got to figure out some way to come to an agreement while the law gets sorted out in Canada. We're still working on the legal piece for the duty to consult, it's called. We think about just some of the big infrastructure projects. If we don't get it right, Coastal Gas Link, Wet Sowetan mm -hmm. blockade, it's not a $4 billion project. It's a $24 billion project. Right. Bob, why would we do this for them? We don't do it for anybody else. Because if you do it the other way, it's going to cost you $20 billion more. I think I can get it for cheaper. I'm just saying. The consultation piece is so fascinating. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about how companies and individuals who are trying to engage in meaningful consultation can do it in a way that it's not a checkbox requirement. And I'm especially thinking about the reality that Indigenous communities are not a monolith, and there are surely diverse perspectives and opinions on any given issue across mm -hmm. different Indigenous communities. So in your experience, what have you seen has been the most effective ways of doing that consultation, even when there's a diverse range of opinions out there? Now you're in the, the duty to consult world, and when is it adequate and meaningful consultation, and when is it enough? Those are the great questions of our time. So what I tell people is, in order to know when it's adequate and meaningful, first of all, you have to understand a little bit of a constitutional lens. So when we look at Section 35 of the Constitution Act, Section 35.1 states that we're to recognize and affirm the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So I always tell people, if you want to know when you've done adequate and meaningful consultation, you'll know when you've recognized and affirmed the rights that they've told you they're concerned about. Once those are addressed, you've done a good job of consulting. And if you haven't, you're going to end up in court. So very straightforward test. So now that we know that we're to recognize and affirm, so what is adequate and meaningful consultation? And I'll give them an exercise and I'll let them go for like half an hour. I need nine words from you. They've got to be kind of legal focused to explain to me what the goal of consultation is. And we get all kinds of warm, fuzzy stuff, talking and give and take and reconciliation. And But the real answer is when you've avoided the unjustifiable infringement of constitutionally protected rights, then you've done adequate and meaningful consultation, which is the flip side of the coin. We're hereby recognize and affirm the right. existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So honestly, if you can do that, those consultation coordinators make 1500 to 2500 a day just because they know the answer to the question, what is the goal of adequate right. and meaningful consultation? That's a great litmus yeah. test and a uh, yeah. clear way for people to really understand the stakes. And then the piece that gets us into trouble about adequate and meaningful consultation is our timelines. Mm -hmm. So we're so Gantt chart focused and timeline focused. And the engineers got it planned out to the day and how much money it's going to cost when we miss the completion line. I can tell you when things are going to go good or going to go bad. Right. About five years before they go good or go bad and usually go bad. Go good, I can tell you sooner because I know the risk has been managed when, say, a mining company has consulted with a community or communities and they show up with an impact and benefit agreement. And what that means is we know there's going to be impacts on your rights through our mining activity, but here's the benefits, employment, procurement, consultation, all of the things that might show up in an impact benefit agreement. If I see one of those, if I were buying stocks on industrial developers, I'd look for the folks that understand this piece and right. invest in them. They've got an impact benefit agreement they're probably going to get to build when they say they're going to build. Right. And the ones that don't are the ones that are trying to push things through. They've got timelines. They can't wait. One of the things that I wanted to turn to is 
your thoughts about what would be the most consequential reforms that we could look to now. The Indian Act is still with us today. Government and Indigenous populations recognize that it's a flawed and destructive framework. Mm -hmm. What can we look to to repair some of the damage that it's done? The tool we have right now and it's called DRIPA legislation, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act is what it stands for. And it comes from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Within its provisions, there's this principle, ILO 169, means free prior and informed consent, FPIC it's called. Mm -hmm. And so I think FPIC gives us a chance to really start to explore how we get beyond the Indian Act. The very first thing it says is that they've got to be free of outside influence and coercion. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? Well, when we look at some of the big pipeline infrastructure stuff in British Columbia, can the government of Canada create something, a band council, mm -hmm. and then go to it for decisions about a pipeline? And so right now to take that approach would be in violation of their own DRIPA legislation. So it would not be free because those band councils get their money from the federal government. There are strings attached. Whether you're going to go into the government or to businesses, you're going to start really thinking about the free piece. Okay, who do we talk to? when it comes to adequate and meaningful consultation. Right. Should we talk to the elected chief and council? And we knew that in Coastal GasLink, one of the big messages coming out over years was, we have signed agreements with all of the elected councils all along the pipeline. Right. And so you knew just by that statement that they were not talking to the hereditary chiefs or they were talking, but they weren't giving it any weight at all. Right. That was the friction point. That was not meaningful consultation. It was slated to be a $4 billion project, but when you factor in the railway blockades and port blockades and policing events across the country that all erupted out of it, it's like a $24 billion project. Right. And right. fairness to uh, Horgan, who's former premier of British Columbia, he said, you know, what just happened there, we're probably not going to do it that way again. Right. Which I took as a signal to say, we're not just going to talk to the band chief and councils anymore. We are going to look for hereditary chiefs or traditional leaders. When I'm talking to the developers, those of you going to mining, forestry, highways, construction, whatever you're going to consult on, I always tell you, if you want to hedge your bets, you're going to consult with the elected chief and council, you're going to consult with the traditional leaders, and you're going to reach out to the whole community and right. make sure they're all on side because the rights are collectively held by a group of people. They have individual and collectively held rights. And so the best way to hedge your bets is to talk to everybody, make sure they're all supportive and not ignore one side over the other. And I think you can make some great inroads in terms of consultation. Inform, we've got to make sure they have information about decisions. They've always said, look, we're not against development but it can't be development at all costs. So they really want us to focus on the environment. And to do that, they need information. Right. And they gotta be informed and they gotta be informed by reliable sources. Oh, you got a problem with our project? You want our hydro lawyer? Mm -hmm. You know, that's not gonna work that well, right? And so they need their information. And then prior, we wanna do it prior in the old days, when I first started doing this work, you had 30 days to respond to permit requests. And if you didn't get a response, the first flow chart I saw in 1994 said, send letter to band, no response, go to permitting, right? It was like, right. wow. Today, you don't get anything done without years of consultation. And if you do try, you end up in a really bad spot. If you have their consent, especially if you get it before you open up a legal and regulatory process, it's going to go easier for you. In terms of risk management, that is the best approach. Go talk to them early, get their consent, then go to the regulator to say, we want to do X. And they'll say, you got to go talk to First Nations. You can say, we have. Here's the impact and benefit agreement. It speeds everything up. It makes it all certain. It's certainty. That's what people are looking for. And Canada does need Indigenous peoples to be supportive. If you want a climate of certainty, economic certainty really is contingent upon how well we're working or not working with Indigenous peoples. So adopting the UN resolution really would be a path for us at a systemic and governance and organizational level to adopt change. Mm -hmm. But as we wrap up, I'd love to hear what are your recommendations and suggestions for individuals who want to bring about change within 
their workplace and within their communities? And what are the most important things that each of us can keep in mind? I think the first thing is, and thanks for wearing the orange shirt, <laughs> I think is that we pay attention to the calls to action and that we actually do some of the things they're asking. So people say to me, but can I do that? Like, how far do I get into this? And, you know, there's even fears about what they can and can't do and whether it's appropriate or not. And I always tell people, look, you have a direct invitation from the survivors of residential schools. They are asking you to do this and to get involved and to learn and to share with your families, your communities, your church groups, your businesses, especially. Mm -hmm. And I think for those of you going into business, there's hardly a business that isn't touched by Indigenous objectives. They've got reconciliation objectives. They've got duty to consult. And I've always said, you know, we train everybody from the Fortune 100 all the way through to nonprofits like the Ontario SBCA and the National Institute for the Blind. I mean, everybody is doing this stuff. I would really think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, look at the calls to action. And there's one for academia, there's one for businesses, there's one for all levels of government, there's one for church groups. So there's tons of great stuff there. Well, this great advice and guidance for all of us, and I'll certainly echo that the calls are so great because they're so clear and direct in what they're asking people and businesses and communities to do. Bob, we so appreciate you being with us here at the school today and for being on this podcast and sharing your deep knowledge and understanding about the history of our country and everything that we have to reckon with. For people who are interested in finding out more about you and your work, where should people go? They can go to our website, Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. And thanks for allowing me the opportunity to do the shameless marketing plug. We have over a thousand articles. We've got free eBooks, 23 things to say and 27 things to not say and terminology. And, and so there's a ton of free resources there for people. And of course there's books and other things like that. Great. Well, we'll check out the website. And again, the book is 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. Bob, again, thank you so much for being here. This has been Rotman Visiting Experts, backstage discussions with world-class thinkers and leaders from our acclaimed speaker series. To find out about upcoming speakers and events visiting us here at Canada's leading business school, please visit us at rotman.utoronto.ca slash events. This episode was produced by Megan Haynes, recorded by Dan Mazzotta, and edited by Damian Kearns. For more innovative thinking, head over to the Rotman Insights Hub and please subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. Thanks for tuning in.